Project. Okay, yeah, hello. And uh, my name is Maus Brown, and this is Punk DIY Ethics and Programming, or how to stop following blindly and build your own goddamn tools. Let me start with a bit about myself. I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I have always been into programming. Like I took C++ in high school. It was the first year they offered it at the school. And a math teacher teaching it that had no programming experience, I ended up mostly running the class, possibly because I just read faster than him. I graduated in 2000 and couldn't afford college, and so I started hitchhiking and riding freight trains around the states. To me, riding freight offered freedom of movement, as well as a personal freedom to go wherever I wanted without the constraints of money. This is not me, but <laughs> this is train. I have a little, really short video in case any of you are unfamiliar with freight trains. It's really poor quality, but it's okay. I mean, you can see that there's no billboards, there's no people, there's no there's nothing but you and the train, and, yeah? So it's very fulfilling to just have this kind of freedom. I mostly got by with being broke, but worked cooking in restaurants whenever I was in a town. 2005, I moved to Berlin to Riga with no money, no return ticket, and I didn't speak a word of German. Uh, having no money and traveling requires improvisation and adaptability. Freight trains never go where they're supposed to. There's no public schedules, and the best map that you're bound to find is about this. Sometimes you get dropped off 30 kilometers out of town and have no option than just to walk back. Sometimes you get kicked out of cities entirely and you're told to leave, like Danville, Kentucky. <laughs> in Cumberland, Maryland. <laughs> uh, you learn to just roll with situations, stay level-headed, and figure them out as they develop. If you decide you can't deal with the situation, you are literally stuck where you are. When I got to Berlin, I lived in collective houses with over 50 people, which is total chaos, but it also offered uh, the, an opportunity to connect to a larger collective of like-minded people. Despite all my traveling, I was always very into technology. I loved computers and the internet. While people were, or were squinting at four-player Goldeneye on N64, I built my first network with coax cables to play Quake 1 <laughs> with 16 people. Big deal at the time. I'm fairly sure that's not an actual ad, but I found it and I couldn't not use it. <laughs> uh, for a time, we rode freight with a laptop and a GPS that was obtained by questionable means. <laughs> um, although professionally, I was skipping between being a cook and a bum. Tech-wise, I always built what I needed in whatever language was needed. I wrote inventory and recipe trackers in kitchens, as well as assorted websites for friends. Um, I kept most of the tech in the, or in the collectives of the houses I was, or I was living at attempting to give con connectivity to houses that were very determined to stay in the 90s. I actually have a friend who worked in a collective of mine who claimed that she was allergic to Wi-Fi, and that was why we shouldn't have Wi-Fi in the bar. Um, DIY and punk thrives on community. With over 50 people living in one collective house, there's plenty of possible manpower and possible creativity although there's just as much laziness as you might assume as well. This, our smaller collective spaces were organized within the house and, various, like, and opened various spaces up to the public, like uh, bars and bike shops and these kind of things. In turn, these spaces provided an income for people that might not otherwise be able to work. On a house scale, our house was a member of a collective of other area punk houses that would all help each other if necessary. We would get whatever, whatever we could to turn into whatever we needed by any means possible. Some people just stole a lot of shoplifting. Local dumpsters of all manner, of all manner of shops were common targets as well. It's fairly surprising what people actually throw away. 
And I was mostly into scavenging from the street. Old furniture, street signs, piles of wood. It was all fair game, and it could all be turned into whatever we needed. One place that I lived at was Riga 84 in Berlin. This house had 56 people living in it. Many guests were essentially non-rent paying permanent inhabitants. So the number was actually about 70. It was a place that had its own bar, had its own cafe, movie theater, bike space, various shops, a band practice space. It was all self-built and collectively run. You could essentially do anything you wanted as long as you could track down the people with the keys. This is, was, was control point. This is the bar to Riga 84. It was also known as the Kellerloch, or basement hole, because that is, this is the entrance and it's literally just a hole covered up with a sheet of metal in the sidewalk. Uh, the bike space was used as a general bike shop as well as being open occasional to the public, but there were large projects as well. Every year, teams from around Europe would build bikes to bring to the Copenhagen Bike Wars, with uh, events such as tall bike jousting. <laughs> and then as well, there was uh, the monster bikes fight. And this I also have a short video of. <laughs> This is as straightforward as it sounds. It's essentially giant self-built bikes breaking each other until there's only one left. <laughs> and sadly, Riga 84 burnt down in mid-2007. But I found this while searching for pictures for this, and I figured I'd share it. Uh, we're definitely closed. <laughs> but I'm really glad that somebody went back and actually changed the profile picture. <laughs> so after the house burnt down, um, I moved into a normal -er house. I got, finally got a visa from, uh, for Germany and started to pursue programming as a freelancer. And a lot of the ideas from the DIY scene carry over to development. You can apply the same inventiveness and improvisation once you define what the problem is. Like, is there an existing goal, or is there, an, is there an existing tool that does what you need to do? If not, is there maybe something open source that you can contribute to and push in that direction? You have to ask yourself, how long would it take you to get familiar with someone else's tool in order to fix it or adapt your workflow around it? And as well, why should you adapt your wor workflow to, any, or to anyone? You work how you work, and it's always better to adapt to a better way, but you shouldn't have to adapt your workflow just to use a certain tool. Um, there's definitely some, not quite drawbacks, but realities to inventing the wheel. If, you, if there's something you're making, there's a pretty good chance that there's someone else out there that's making the same thing, possibly with a head start or with a larger team. So, what unique goals will your tool accomplish? Or on similar task, how fast is it comparatively? A tenth of a millisecond is not that big for a single operation, but if you're doing this all the time, it starts to add up. Uh, there an, there's an upside. In the end, you have something that's much better, that you know exactly how it works, you know exactly how to fix it, and how to add features. You can add or remove features or fix problems if necessary, much like reading a book written in your own handwriting. You learn a lot by doing it yourself that can be applicable in your next projects as well. In July 2013, I was hired by Sociomantic Labs. It's a Berlin startup that provides computing solutions to the ad industry and mostly of real-time bidding. I wrote Banner CSS. But is my first non-freelance tech job. This was one of the... This is Manta Ray. This is a live CSS editor that was... This is a live CSS editor that was the very center of our workflow. The problem was that Manta Ray 
really sucked. The live CSS editor worked, very, worked great, but the text area is just that. It's a text area, for some reason, green text on black. I blame the matrix. It's not monospace. It's got bad white space. If you look at these five lines, they are all 80 characters. And so the UI, this says undefined. If you click it, it turns blue or green. All of this functionality has been lost. This says undefined. None of the buttons work. They all presumably did something at some point. But so we decided that we would have to, or essentially we would write code in Sublime and then paste it in, which isn't what a live CSS editor should be. <laughs> so we decided to replace it with a real editor. Um, me and a coworker each took a side. I would, investigating building our, I, I would investigate building our own editor, and he was going to investigate the benefits of Ace. Ace is an embeddable code editor maintained by Cloud9, IDE, and Mozilla. It looked great. It could do most anything. But we didn't need it to do everything. We actually needed it to do a couple things that it didn't do. So if we went with Ace, we would actually have to change our concept and our ideals of what we wanted to accomplish. So he started investigating Ace, and I just started writing a text editor. I didn't know where to start. I changed the text box to a content editable div and essentially prayed to the gods of Stack Overflow. I don't think anything was actually ever technically decided. After two weeks, my coworker came to me with reasons that we should use Ace, and I showed him the first working version of a text editor. So I kept building. A couple of months of building, and we had ChipChan, which is, was the next step up. And this was the first, uh, we redid the whole UI. But as well, you can see this looks, this is fairly usable, readable, and monospace. <laughs> but as well, like some of the things that we would have had to lose, like for instance, uh, we, we deal a lot with banners, and so you, do, you could just do, do BS1 and tab, you know, dot, dot logo, and it was very much what we needed at the time. And a lot of things, like just to, like it was specifically tailored for us, for our uses. It wouldn't be very useful to anyone else, probably. In Manta Ray, if you accidentally navigated away from your page, you would lose all of your work, which is a very horrible thing to have to deal with. <laughs> and so with ChipChan, we ended up, it auto-saves every five minutes into local storage. And then as well, you can, you can save and load. And of course, that, automatic, that would automatically get, update the CSS on the other side. This was good. It was, it was a big step in the right direction. But at some point, ChipChan had reached as far as it could. It worked well, but I had no contextual knowledge of what line or character you were on. And in order to do that, we would need to rebuild it from scratch again with a much, much smarter core. And that became Sushi. It was actually Sushi side by side with, with Ace Editor. Sushi is still a work in progress, but it's definitely, it's gotten to the point where it can edit its own code. As well, like we've, we've worked in tabs and you can drag and drop files in, and it's, very, uh, it's much more functional, and it's into the future, it'll be able to adapt to much more than, uh, than ChipChan could have. Sushi is built in vanilla JavaScript, except the only framework in, included in it is Microbe. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Microbe is a framework built by our team tailored for our needs. It started as a project to better understand the inner workings of jQuery and array-like objects. And more methods were added as we needed them. As we started adding more methods, we realized we were less and less dependent on third-party frameworks, we, to the point that we've stopped using them in, altogether in some projects. Other people's frameworks can be unfamiliar and less flexible than you may need. 
Is it worth it to learn an entire framework for just one project? Especially if you only need a small portion of the framework. How does the framework do its magic? In order to fully use the framework, you, or sometimes in order to use a framework to its fullest, you need to know how it's working underneath. And then what if functionality is missing or needs to be changed? Can you add stuff to it? In order to completely take the place of larger frameworks in our uses, Micro has a number of challenges to overcome. If it's something that's unique to our needs, then it might not make sense to make it open source because it loses this uniqueness. In some aspects of Microbe, it competes with large frameworks that are contributed by lots of people. And even, it, even if it's equal on everything, if the speed, speed gains are only minimal, then it might not be worth using it just due to adaptability for other people. So at some point, we started running speed tests. And they didn't look good. It was, Microbe was very good at some things, but as you can see, uh, in, a, in some queries, jQuery was actually seven times faster. And so it's, but it's not, it's not a finished product. It's good at some things, but terribly slow at others. And then the next step is to find why and keep digging and as long as the structure remains content, we keep improving the underlying code. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Sushi is now a full code editor that we use internally. And then Micro will just get faster and faster as we work on it. And DIY, it's not the easy way out. But if you pursue it, it can lead to advanced custom tools that developers actually know every inch of the code to. Thank you. Reject.